So I saw a recent comment on my channel where someone asked me very specifically about my thoughts on graph neural networks. To me, graph neural networks are great in theory, but not in practice is my overall opinion on them. And I know that is a kind of controversial opinion. So let me dive specifically into this. I do have a lot of work and research that I've put out specifically around graph neural networks. Like um, my opinion on them has evolved over time. And my opinion on them has evolved very specifically just uh, due to uh, practice, right? Theory versus practice. And then uh, to me, that's like, I don't know, an important thing, right? Like um, it, it, something might work in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. And then something might work in practice, but it's hard to put theory behind it. Um, and these two things come up a lot. And then to me, graph neural networks are a perfect example of this. I'm going to show you the first, uh, rather than just explain it out, my thoughts, and, and talk about them philosophically, let's just do two experiments here. I'm going to show you and give you code for two very different types of graph neural networks, right? So we'll just examine these as a whole and holistically, and then we'll talk about them, and then I'll show you a few different things. So first thing that we're going to do is to, uh, look at a graph convolutional neural network. So a graph convolutional neural, neural network is a type of neural network designed to work with graph structured data. Think of social networks, like people are nodes, friendships are edges, molecules, atoms are nodes, bonds are edges, or like citation networks, like papers are nodes, and citations are edges, etc. It's all nodes and edges. And then all graph neural networks come down to this concept of nodes and edges, right? You essentially, you uh, create and you plot individual data points as nodes, which is, this is very important. And we're going to come back to this, right? Uh, which you would think intuitively that this is good. This is very bad. So you plot it as, an, as a node. And then edges are kind of the boundaries. Um, and then the you can bundle the node to the edge. And then so that bundling process gives you another data set, right? And like uh, another way to measure essentially and then so the core idea of a GCN is uh, to learn how to represent each node in the graph by considering its own features for example in a social network this might be a user's age interests locations etc the features of its neighbors so a user's representation is influenced by the features of their friends and the structure of the graph how the nodes are connected the edges matter and so the GCN does this through a process called message passing or neighborhood aggregation. Essentially, each node passes its features to its neighbors and each node receives a message from its neighbors. These messages are then combined, aggregated, to update the node's representations. The process is repeated layer by layer, allowing information to propagate through the graph. In summary, the code defines a GCN model, provides functions for training and evaluation, creates dummy data, and demonstrates how to train and evaluate the model on this data. The core of the GCN is the Ford method, which implements the message passing and aggregation operations using the GCN con, uh, the, essentially this uh, layer, the GCN con layer, and uh, from Torch, we're using Torch Geometric very specifically, as you see here, we're using Pip install Torch here, and the training loop uses standard PyTorch techniques for optimization and loss calculation. Going into the model, very simply, it's just a, a simple convolutional neural network. We're putting in, uh, essentially, uh, we have our number of features, our hidden channels, number of classes, number of layers, dropout rate, et cetera, right? So we just create our neural network here. Um, we give it some arguments to, to plot on a graph. <laughs> uh, and then we uh, essentially build and construct this model to uh, plot and then um, predict the graph representations, right? So, uh, and then we create uh, here, uh, we get some data. So number of graphs, number of nodes. Uh, this is all of our data, our dummy data that we're creating. This is uh, for the model itself, uh, what the model looks like in our training for the model. Uh, so we're gonna uh, train, uh, it's, this is a small model overall. So it's a three layer model, um, learning rate, we're setting to 0.01. We're training on this instance for 20 epochs up front. Uh, and then just, you know, some other settings here. Uh, we go through bottom line, I want to showcase here, right? 32% accuracy. Like, um, so, and 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 then here's the, the training and, and um, our loss rate, a few things within this, right? With our test loss, it's like, this doesn't uh, learn like you think, it, like it doesn't learn like a a, a, a a different type of a neural network, right? We go like, um, look at our Tesla, our accuracy, like 34, 24, 28, 28, 28, 28, 30, 
26, we're bouncing around on the accuracy, right? And we do hit, like, our peak is 42. Um, and then we go 42, 40, and then 32 is where we end. So, like, if we had ended at Epoch 18, we'd be at 42% accuracy. We'd be at 10% more accuracy uh, than what we're showing out here. If we had just trained for one Epoch, we'd be at 2% better accuracy uh, than we are at for training for 20 Epochs. And um, so... Uh, this is a, a inherent within a, like a GNN frameworks overall, right? This is a artifact of GNN frameworks and training GNN frameworks. We can look at this uh, through our next example here, right? So uh, this is a simple model and then just a simple illustration. Let's look, look <clears throat> let me give it justice, build out a more robust model. So in this instance, we're going to build out a graph attention transformer, right? A GAT. Uh, and then so I'm going to pull out the GAT, and then GAT is a more sophisticated type of GNN compared to the basic GCN. The fundamental differences lie in how it handles the message passing or the neighborhood aggregation step. In this instance, GCN uses simple averaging, so a basic uh, GCN treats all neighbors equally, whereas our GAT introduces attention, and it learns how much attention to pay to each neighbor when updating a node's representation. Instead of a simple average, it takes a weighted average of the neighbor's features where the weights are determined by the attention mechanism itself. This allows for the model to focus on the most relevant neighbors for each node. In summary, our GAT improves upon our GCN by introducing an attention mechanism that allows for the model to learn the relative importance of different neighbors. This makes our GAT more powerful and flexible offering uh, often leading to better performance on graph structured data, especially when relationships are complex or non-uniform. And then, so this should perform better than our other model. Here's all the code for the model overall. And then da, 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 final result, I trained it for 100 epochs, right? So I, I trained it even more 40%. <laughs> and then, uh, so what's our peak? I think it's our peak is 46. Yes, nothing higher than 46. And then so, uh, 48. So, oh, our peak, we have a 48 here we could have gotten to. Um, and then so if we'd have trained it for a few epochs, we could have, if we trained it for two epochs, we would have gotten to 36. Uh, and then we got, uh, we ended up at 40. So uh, as you can see, we didn't improve very much overall on the exact same results overall, right? So in practice, uh, practice compared to theory, there's something missing here. And then so you can clearly see at this point that there's a, something, a missing element within this, right? There's something missing between the theory and the practice. So let me outline this, this to you and, and, and showcase this to you very simplistically, uh, like what the the um, difference is, right? Um, and then so in this instance, the, the uh, I make this argument around dimensionality a lot on my channel, that essentially all of this boils down to dimensionality. Uh, and I think there's a lot of consequences beyond just AI models with regards towards that, but sticking to AI models in general when it comes to dimensionality, the more dimensionality of data that they have access to, the better. Like, I don't think it's it's possible to give them too much dimensionality. Like, they want more and more. And then so dimensionality is just like another um, layer, another feature of the data. And then so remember going back to our concept of nodes, where essentially we plot each individual concept as a uh, node in this instance, right? So in this instance, when you when when you talk about and you convert that to dimensionality, what that means is that each one of our representations on our graph is a singular number, a singular dimension. So um, one, let's say that one is king, two is uh, two is queen, three is kingdom, four is uh, five, some, I don't know, you know, uh, zero is castle. Um, they're only one dimension. And then so while that's good, while you would think like, okay, so th like, that's how the human brain <laughs> operates and, and it thinks of these things. That's not how the AI brain is operating and thinking of these things. And then that's another important factor to bring into this as well, is that so kind of the overall thought process with graph neural networks and GNNs overall is that like we're kind of bringing this more into the base level of uh, like base language, if you will, of the AI model. But if you think about it and understand how the models are doing and what they're actually doing, this is also an abstraction for the base model, like for the AI model. This is not their like their base language. <laughs> this is just as much or more of an abstraction as the tokenization and the vectorization process is. You're actually, you're extracting this from vectors, right? So you're taking uh, 
an, an abstraction, and then you're abstracting from that. <laughs> and then, like, which is the same thing that we're doing with language, uh, et cetera, right? So this is no different than putting it into English. Uh, but you're, it's actually worse, because if I was to put it into English with, like, a bag of words representation or something like that, I would, I would get more than one dimension per, um, like, word or, or token within this instance, right? And then so you can, in this instance, uh, create more and more feature pairs, right? So then this is what I show you here, uh, where we increase the, the number of edges, which would be our number of like feature pairs, and then we can increase the number of graphs, and then so, uh, and create like kind of connections uh, in between the data sets, but, and then so this gets like complicated as to the uh, layers of your data, like graphically, like in, in graphing terms, this is hard, right? You're layering multiple graphs on top of each other just to get to this simple data set and then this is we're looking at here um, 30 times 25 nodes uh, is our total uh, number of nodes that we're looking at in this instance which would be a very small number of parameters but when we're converting this to nodes to a graph this is already uh, very large right um, and then so just looking at this this graph structure if we we essentially we flatten this out again just highlighting this concept right it's just one dimension when you're talking about this data and then even even if you connect and you're like, I'm going to have like a whole bunch of data sets here, right? Like this is like, uh, uh, let, let's say that this is a book. Um, and then this is what your essential representation looks like. And this is what your book comes out to, uh, which is great. But then it's one dimensional representations across all of these representations, right? Uh, uh, and then that's the, like the key point that I want to highlight and get across here is that this is essentially the end result that the model is working with when it comes to a, a, a GNN framework. Um, and then this is representative of the entire data set. So um, this, uh, these like two images are what the model is using to predict the entirety of the data set uh, uh, in a GNN, like the whole data set, whole thing, right? And then so let's contrast that to a hypervector. Um, and then so in a hypervector, this could be, and then this is a very small hypervector, right? This is a 10 dimensional hypervector. Um, and then a hypervector can be representative of not just the whole uh, the whole data set, it could be representative of a portion of the data set, it could be representative of a word, et cetera. So we can break down wh exactly what hypervectors are and what they're representative of. Generally, they're more representative of categories of information, right? Um, but so uh, generally speaking, uh, within this, what we can see is that we even with a 10-dimensional hypervector, we're giving the model um, more robust ways to represent the data and then more robust representations of the data in the ways that we're presenting it. So let's present, uh, pretend that um, this is a 10 dimensional hypervector with 10 categories. So we would be giving this model, uh, these data sets and these graphs times 10 uh, for the entirety of the data set as opposed to these two graphs here. And then two images for the entirety of the data set. Here's our data set for each category. And then especially you can see the heat map, right? And then this heat map goes up the more hyper, the more dimensions that we put here. Uh, and then at this point, we're getting to so many, so much dimensionality within this data just based off of 50 dimensional hypervector that I can no longer even produce the, the middle graph here. Uh, and then a thousand dimensional hypervector, which is very typical. This is the most typical that you would see within a hypervector. Um, uh, this is what you're getting, right? This like like a uh, very clear like a thousand dimensions of data, as opposed to this is what a one-dimensional hypervector would look like. This is the graph data. This is what your your GNN is getting, as opposed to let's say a hypervector, which is this, this, or this, this, or this. I mean, it's very clear night and day once you put it into those simplistic terms, right? This is actually kneecapping the model. Like GNNs overall, the theory of them is great. The, the, in theory, they're the best thing ever. If this whole entire system were theory-based and um, didn't actually have to run in, in real-world terms, uh, graphs are amazing. But this is... Uh, far superior in the real world than this. It's, it's just, I mean, I, I don't have to do anything more than this, I don't think. Um, and then so, if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe.